welcome. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jake, Jake Clark, and I'm one of the uh, animators, designers, concept artists, and uh, idea people on uh, the upcoming indie game Cuphead, which is uh, still not out yet. Apparently, games take a long time to make. <laughs> Nobody told us, so sorry. But you'll find out very soon why it's been taking so, so damn long. Uh, so, a little bit, a little bit about me. Uh, I went to school at uh, Capilano University in Vancouver. Uh, I was trained in traditional paper animation. And then, uh, oh, and the, if anybody's interested in learning 2D animation, Capilano University in Vancouver is amazing. I definitely wouldn't be here without it. Um, so after graduating, I worked on a few 2D cartoons in Vancouver's TV animation industry, uh, Mother Up for Hulu, Turbo FAST for Netflix, uh, Breadwinners for Nickelodeon. And then out of nowhere one day, I got hired to work on Cuphead, and I've been doing that for two years now, or a little bit over two years. And it's actually my first uh, job in video games, and I feel very lucky. Um, so what is Cuphead? It's a 2D action action game. Uh, the gameplay is inspired by games like Gunstar Heroes, uh, Contra Hardcore, Metal Slug, just games from the 16-bit era. And it's styled to look like a 1930s cartoon, like uh, Betty Boop, Popeye, old Mickey Mouse cartoons, that kind of thing. Um, it's the love child of Chad and Jared Moldenhauer, who are my bosses, and they grew up uh, playing those, those kind of games and watching those kind of cartoons. And uh, that's why the game looks and plays like it does. Um, we animate it and ink it on paper, traditionally. And the, uh, the backgrounds are traditional watercolor paintings. The, uh, the music is like live recorded uh, by a big jazz band. So we're really going all out to make it as authentic to how they would have done it, how they would have made a game in the, in the 30s as we possibly can without going overboard. Um, so I'll show you the trailer we, we released in 2015 to give you a much better idea of what, what this game's about. So this is the mermaid class that you just saw, um, and I'll take you through her being just an idea to a finished design that's ready to animate. Um, so first of all is just what makes a 1930s design. So these are what I always keep in mind when designing. I just kind of, they're just broad general rules that I try to follow whenever I'm doing any kind of design for the game. Uh, but of course, any rule can be broken, but for the most part, um, 30s designs, usually air towards simplicity. They don't tend to make overly detailed designs. Um, they're usually made of solid shapes. And uh, why I think that's really important is that uh, like any 30s design can be turned in space perfectly without needing to do any kind of cheats. So you're almost like trying to draw a 3D model in a way. So it's not like uh, a lot of modern cartoons, like has anybody here seen Clone High? which is a fantastic show, but it has a lot of uh, like stylized corners and edges on characters and things that like you wouldn't be able to turn Abe from clone high like 20 degrees to the left, if you know what I mean. He just has a lot of stylistic tricks and they don't really translate that well to three-dimensional turns. Um, a lot of, most 3D characters are usually pretty rounded, a lot of round shapes, round lines, um, sometimes uh, sharp fingers, sometimes sharp hair or sharp hat, but for the most part, a lot of round shapes. And then the term I'm sure everybody's heard of is rubber hose, 
which is sort of like most of the characters are almost, it's almost like they're made of rubber, both in that you can, you can really stretch them a lot and squash them and play with them in that way when you're animating, but also a lot of them have kind of bendy tube limbs. Um, and the, lastly, uh, limited features. By that, mean, by that I mean, uh, like we're trying to make this game look like a 30s cartoon. And how do we do that? We do it by referencing all the different shapes that they used to use in the 30s, the different way they drew hands, the different way they drew eyes. So in a way, when you're designing for, for a 30s cartoon, it's almost like Frankensteining together a design in a sense, not entirely, but most characters have a certain way of doing things. Uh, so the first thing I do before starting a design is just think, think, think. Um, yeah, I think about what would contrast the other bosses, because we want all the different bosses in the game to be very unique to each other. And what has been done already, both in our game and in other games, because we don't want to do anything that's been done before. And then what would excite me as the player? So I actually imagine myself playing the game. I try to see in my head the little cuphead guy running around, shooting, and try to imagine what it would be exciting to actually interact with. And then I think, what would I enjoy animating? Because of course you want your design to be as good as possible, but you don't want to put in ridiculous amounts of detail that make it very hard to, to turn in space and to animate. Uh, for example, I'm showing you how to design the mermaid. One of my early concepts, or one of my early ideas was to have her have a pirate ship on her head. And if you imagine trying to animate that and turn that in space, it would not be a great time. So. You want to be animating something that you enjoy, your animation is going to be better, it's not going to be as much of a headache. Like if you're trying to do a 3D animation with a rig that you hate, your animation is just not going to be as good as if you're using a rig that you like, right? And then I think, what would have lots of gameplay and animation potential? So I just want the character to be capable of uh, a, a broad range of gestures with the body and actual subject matter of like what the attacks would be. So these are the very first designs that I did. So I was going for strong, fierce, wild, magic, magical. I wanted her to have octopus hair and look as if she ate pirate ships. So uh, I first did these before doing any reference, um, which like reference is very important, but I do think there's kind of a value to taking a swing at something, like a design or an animation, before you reference, just, just because uh, Prior to referencing, you have an idea in your head of what this thing is that's based on everything that you've seen. So for this, the idea in my head is based on all the mermaids I've seen, all the strong characters I've seen, both in cartoons, games, and real life, all the fierce things I've seen, all the wild and magical things I've seen, and so on. So everyone in this room, if tasked with designing a mermaid, everybody has a unique idea right off the bat. And uh, it's very rare that you would, you would do just hammer out a design without doing any reference and have that be the final design, but I do something, something valuable to, to uh, starting without reference. Uh, so I, I got some notes back to try her to look a little bit more like Betty Boop or a little bit more like Olive Oil. Uh, so I looked at what makes Betty Boop Betty Boop. I looked at her, the shape of her eyes, and she has a tiny nose and tiny mouth, and... I thought quite a bit of that could apply to the mermaid design. I didn't really look at olive oil. I, didn't really, I just didn't really think that she fit that well. Sorry, Chad. Um, and then I opened up reference to other games or other, other characters that I thought could help, like Eliza from Fantastic Journey, which is where I got the pirate ship on the head idea, um, Splash Woman from Mega Man 9, and then, oh, I was also told to try some different things on her head other than the octopus hair. And I just felt Wonder Woman sort of fitted the vibe that I was going for. Um, so then I did some of these where I was experimenting with what she's wearing on her head. Uh, a lot of these have those Betty Boop kind of eyes and uh, quite, a bit, quite a few of her features. She's definitely the primary reference for the character. Um, yeah, most of these designs are just heads, which in hindsight I Probably would have done more full body designs, but this was uh, two years ago, and I'm, I'm a growing boy, still learning. 
Um, so then Chad, who is the art director on Cuphead, he took a couple of the drawings and he play, just played around with maybe she could have skinnier arms, maybe she could have a diff different hands. And then uh, on the bottom left is just a drawing of his where he was experimenting with some of his ideas. Then uh, he gave me, there's a girl from the Moth and the Flame on the top right. And we thought she has a cool kind of eyes that could, could fit the character. And then uh, I, I was mentioning I wanted her to be a bit thicker. So, th so uh, they gave me an early Betty Boop design where, she, where she's a bit thicker too to reference proportions. Um, so yeah, anything that they can possibly reference, anything we can, we can reference, we just do it. Um, there's no reason not to. We, of course, don't steal stuff, but you, you got a reference if you want to make it look like a specific style, of course. Um, so they went with the octopus hair, which I was very happy about. Um, and then, yeah, I did just a couple full bodies and a couple of heads. I find that the longer the design process goes on, the fewer drawings you have to do, because you, you start out trying to figure out what it's going to be. Like, what's the subject matter? Who, what kind of mermaid? What does she have in her head? And so on. And then you kind of get to just specifically just how big are different things, how big are her eyes, and things like that. So you kind of narrow it down, and you just, and I find I get a better sense of what they want as time goes on. And so they chose the one on the left here. And Chad uh, did a different chest piece. It's a little bit more like uh, Ariel from Little Mermaid. Um, and then this is actually the final design. We don't, or I can't actually speak for the other animators, um, but uh, before animating, I don't make, we don't make like a full turnaround model sheet kind of thing. We tend to kind of treat the idol as the model sheet because everything goes into the idol, everything comes out of the idol. And generally in the 30s, those cartoons weren't super strict about models like, uh, like a Disney princess cartoon would be. It's very different. Uh, so I'll show you the process in doing her idol animation. So the first thing is I just like to figure it out before I start drawing, as much as I can anyways. Um, because we're animating on paper, the stakes are pretty high. Like, if you're 10 hours into an animation and you find out that you made a critical error, it's going to be a really, really long night. So you want to know that it's going to work as early as you can. And it's, it's just way harder to change things if you're doing it on paper. Uh, so I just visualize, I just try to imagine, try to see in my head what, what would work, what, and then I, I, what has been done before, and so on. And then, then I act it out. It's, it, I don't really think of it as acting. It's more like, like a little kid running around in the sandbox pretending they're a monster kind of thing. Ah, and then you just, yeah, I wouldn't call that acting. But you, uh, it's just a really good way to get a starting point. Um, you just try things because a lot of what you're going to be animating is going to have a head. It's going to have arms. It's going to have legs. Even if it doesn't, you can still use your body you can kind of use your body as a tool just to test different animations on the fly, just to get a starting point. And um, then points to hit. So what I mean by that is that um, I, try to, I, I try to figure out what is non-negotiable, what is definitely, what needs to be in this animation. For example, uh, for the mermaid, she's swimming in the water. Um, the background is panning, so she's always moving, she's swimming, and so that means for sure, she has to do like a hip, a hip sway. She has to. So instead of one, like worrying about what she's going to do with her lower, lower, lower half of her, of her body, you, uh, it's more just how is she going to sway her hips? Because I already know that she's definitely going to sway her hips. And then uh, also another point that I needed to make sure to hit is that um, she needs her hands to be at the ready. Because if you're fighting a tiny plane that's flying around, you need your hands ready to do things. You don't see a boxer go into a fight with their hands behind their back. Um, and then I wanted it to have a dance-ish kind of quality, because a lot of 30s cartoons, a lot of the characters are sort of dancing and bobbing most of the time, really. So a lot of the animations in Cuphead have a sort of dance-like quality. Um, and then I thumbnail and reference generally, but I did not for this one. I felt like I had a good enough idea. 
and I just kind of started going straight into the rough, but usually I would thumbnail and reference. Those are very good ideas. Uh, so this is the, the first drawings that I did for the idol. I leave it pretty damn rough, or these are done in blue pencil. You can't really tell, of course. Um, but I leave it super rough just because I don't want it to be a huge time commitment. So in case I have to do it again, it's not that big of a, that big of a deal. Um, but I just want to clearly communicate exactly what's going on. Um, and then I took those same four drawings and I tied them down with the final, fi into the final model. So this is the final design. Like I added little, little nubs on the tentacles at the top and scales on the bottom and all that. But I want to have like a solid skeleton to work off, work off of. So I want to just lock it down in a few drawings, keep in mind how all the different elements are going to move. And it's, again, my kind of, the hardest part of animation for me is the entire time before I know that it's going to work. So I just want to lock it down, make sure that it's going to work, and then the rest is just, I, it's a lot less stressful that way. Um, so then I did four breakdowns. I'm not here to tell you what breakdowns are. Um, you know, it's, I emphasize the drag of the tentacles and offset limbs and all that stuff. And then I did uh, eight more drawings to put it on twos. This is uh, 16 drawings total. Um, and each, I, I did, putting it onto twos, every single in between was basically just another mini breakdown. But then uh, once it's on twos, taking it to ones, if there aren't a lot of exaggerated arcs, then I, I'll basically just turn my brain off, probably put on a podcast or something, and just straight, in, or halfway in between between everything. I don't have to keep in mind exactly how everything's turning in space and things like that. It's just if the line's here and then the line's there, the in-between line's going to be right in the middle. That's usually what they did in the 30s anyways. But we just definitely don't have time to be doing even more mini breakdowns to get it down to, to ones. And then here's the final animation. It's uh, 32 drawings on 32 pieces of paper, which would then, I would then scan them, I would send them off, and then they would be inked by hand onto 32 more pieces of paper. And that is why we're not done the game yet. Because <laughs> uh, we're ridiculous. But hey, it's coming out soon. Um, now I'll show you something from the Tombstone boss, who is uh, the final phase of the slime boss. Uh, he's a little slime, and then a big slime, and then the big slime is crushed by his own tombstone, and you fight the tombstone. It makes sense. And I'll show you his uh, slam attack. So this is what I got from Chad. They just, just a quick thumbnail to show exactly what's, what's going on. Um, and then I didn't have to do a whole lot of planning and thinking about this one. I mean, I'm working with just a slab of stone. This says you make it go down, it goes whap. That's, you can't really read that in any other way. You don't need to do a lot of thumbnailing or anything. So I did uh, just the main extremes. Uh, for, for at this point, they would test to see how it's going to work in the game, how it's going to visually be laid out, how it's going to affect the gameplay, how many frames I'm going to have to have him slam down to the final pose, which is where it would actually do damage to the player. So we figure out all that kind of stuff, and we lock it down in the, in the rough stage. And then I go ahead with it. Uh, but this is, these are, this is the rough. It's, I think it's just four drawings, maybe five. Again, it's just to show exactly what's going on. I added a screen shake in TV Paint, uh, which is the program that we used to shoot, or that I used to shoot. I think a couple animators use something else. But uh, yeah, just to help emphasize what's going to happen, because it's actually going to shake the screen in game, as you'll see later. Uh, so then I added all the details, locked it down, and uh, here it is on twos. And then here it is on ones. So an animation like this, none of the, none of the, the in-betweens would really be mindless. It doesn't really work when a, something's moving in this kind of way. And uh, here it is actually in the game. Uh, just a quick little thing I wanted to talk about with the antic, how he, he leans back there before he slams down. Um, I wanted to specifically make sure that he leaned back enough that I would get enough perspective change that, that you would see the dark color under the base of it. You would get, do you see the, the light rim line underneath the top of the thing and the light spot underneath where the slime protrudes? Because um, 
the point of an antic, generally, in something like this is to get the player's attention. You want them to know that they need to pay attention, they need to get the hell out of the way, or whatever it is. You just want to get the player's attention. So, I mean, I could have just had him squash down or stretch up a little bit for the antic, but if I do it this way, then I not only get change of shape, but I get change of color and change of perspective as well, because I find kind of just the more something changes, the more visual gravity it's going to have because you want the player to notice as much as you can help. Okay, here's the Cigar Boss. And uh, this is actually a world first reveal. Nobody has seen this guy yet. Um, you're very, very lucky people. Mm. Um, and I'll show you his death animation. So, yeah, I just started out, uh, I was given quite a bit of freedom with, with this one, which is really nice when that happens. So. Basically, I sort of just went through the same, design, the same process I go through when designing something. So I look at all the other death animations in the game, all other death animations in other games, and so on, and just see what's been done, what would be interesting, what would get me excited, and, and so on like that. So the first idea I had was his, the ashy part of his head lights up, and he sort of gets smoked from the top down, and he's left as a pile of ashes. But this worked better for a different animation. Thought maybe he could be leaned back crying, ashes pouring out of his head, maybe hunched over forward, little bits falling off of his, his uh, head. Maybe burst into flames and scream, smoke away the pain of, of losing. <laughs> Cough up cigarettes. Or split in half and pour ash all over the place, but it's way too gnarly. And uh, the game is rated E for everyone, so we're not doing that one. Um, so this is the one that we went with. Um, yeah, definitely a Monty Python-inspired uh, idea. And we went with it because, one, there's no other death, in the game, death animation in the game like it, but also it gives kind of a cool sense of scale because you're tiny compared to this giant cigar that you're fighting, and then the cigar is tiny compared to whatever's crushing the cigar, so you feel extra small. Uh, so I was given just a rough thumbnails to test it with the background, see that it would actually, see how it would work on the background platform. And then uh, Joseph Coleman uh, is the animator of the, the secret character that is stomping him. Uh, so he sent some leg designs and uh, we picked the middle one. Then I did uh, just rough outlines basically of the extremes of the thing so that we know, because the cigar is on a platform and we need to, we need to know that it's going to match the background properly. Then I did just the main keys. Um, oh, I did some reference and discovered a fetish of crushing, crushing things, like cigars, which was quite enlightening. You're, you're welcome, look it up. It's very interesting. Anyways, uh, so here's the, the rough animation. Um, and with this one, I felt pretty confident in it. It seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of different ways that it could go. So I didn't really bother like putting it on twos and then sending it off. I just went straight to ones. I just, that's what I did because I'm a rebel. Um, and then so why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we animate it on paper? Why do we ink it on paper? Why do we do the backgrounds traditionally watercolors? Why the live jazz band? We just want to make it as authentic to the 30s as we, as we can. Where we draw the line is we don't, or we color in Photoshop. We don't ink onto transparent cell and paint on the back of the cell, because that would just be completely insane, just pure frustration. And you wouldn't actually gain anything from doing that. But we think that you do gain something from doing it on paper. I find that, like, for me anyways, my drawings are just plain better if I'm animating on paper. Um, and the, doing it with a live jazz band, it sounds way better than if you tried to get it to just sound like it was done in the, in the 30s with MIDI instruments, right? And I also think you've got a quality of actually doing real watercolor backgrounds rather than, I mean, you can make a digital watercolor color looking background, but yeah, I do think you kind of lose something there. Um, and then, yeah, we want to help keep paper animation alive because there aren't a whole lot of games or cartoons really these days that are made with it. Um, and also, it's just the most fun way to do it. Like, it's what the team wants to do. It's, we have a great time doing it this way, more fun than we would if we did it digitally. And we think that in this case, it's worth it. And 
Like, we really want to do it. We really want to make a game that's like they would have done in the 30s, rather than just try to make it look like we did it. Whoops. Uh, so why the 1930s style? Is this not playing? Hmm. One second here. There we go. OK. So yeah, I mean, the 30s style just perfectly fits a side-scrolling game. A lot of the compositions in 30s cartoons, they actually look a lot of the stuff takes place on a flat plane. And it seems like, I mean, when I first saw the trailer for the game, I thought, why has nobody thought of this before? Like, it seems like such a perfect fit. But apparently, they were the first to really go through with it. Um, and they're just, those, create, those cartoons are just super creative, just one interesting idea after another. Um, and a lot of that kind of thing is not really in cartoons these days. Um, and then the, what I think is the most important reason to do 30s cartoons, or the biggest benefit of doing it in this style, is that we have complete freedom over the gameplay. The gameplay is not limited by the subject matter. What that means is, uh, like, anything can happen in a 30s cartoon. You got uh, Ghost Man in the bottom middle, he's pulling his head off, turning it into a bottle, pouring a drink, pouring it in his neck, dancing lamps, lamps all kinds of crazy stuff. So we can just say, like, I want a boss that uh, I want a boss that shoots something out of his or shoots three things out of his stomach in a, in a spread, and then those things uh, explode, and then three other things chase you around. Okay, and then once the gameplay's figured out, then we can fill in the subject matter after that. So we could say it's uh, a clown bear and a mouth opens up in his belly, and bees fly out, and the bees explode, and then ghost bees chase you around. That could happen in a 30s cartoon. So we're just, we could do whatever we want for the gameplay, and we're not, we're, like, if, if the game was, if it looked like King of the Hill, and it was in a King of the Hill kind of world, you wouldn't be able to do this kind of thing. You'd be much more limited in what you can do. You can make a sweet game, don't get me wrong, but. You couldn't have Hank Hill have a, a mouth open up in his belly and bees fly out. It just wouldn't fly. Um, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Um, follow me at, at jclarkdude on Twitter. Uh, I'll be posting a, a lot of animations, a lot of designs and concept arts as I can. I can currently only show what's come out in trailers, uh, what we've shown in gameplay videos and stuff like that. But once I'm able to, I'll be dumping basically everything that I like online. But uh, yeah, that'll be pretty soon. It's coming out this year. We're getting real close. And we'll, we'll post about the release date when we know, once it's, totally, once it's totally nailed down. We'll let everybody know on social media and all that. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the boot camp.